Hi, welcome back to my channel. My name is Rachel. That is the R in the RK Stumbling Bear, and I'm a reader and a writer. So this week we got the Nebula nominations announced, and I would like to read through them and discuss them with you. I'm actually happy that I have read some of these nominations, whereas in years past, I hadn't, so I had a lot to catch up on. But I decided to start off with the short stories. So this video will be me talking about the six short stories that have been nominated, and I'm going to start from my least favorite and go to my favorite. I am not eligible to vote for the Nebulas. I am not a member of SIFWA, the Science Fiction Writers of America but I normally see some crossover based on from what they nominate to what then gets nominated for the Hugos. And I will be putting in my ballot this week, so I really wanted to get some of these things read before I finish that. And I was feeling pretty weak on the short stories in the novelette category, so that is where I've started. But this is just about the short stories, so let's go ahead and jump into it. Also, down in the description, I'm going to have the links for these short stories so that then you can go ahead and read them. I do want to start off with saying I don't think that any of these are bad stories or that they aren't deserving of their nomination. There's just certain ones that worked better for me. And I'm sure it's going to come out to be different for you as well when you read them. But I do think that all of these deserve to be nominated. So coming in at number six for me is Laughter Among the Trees by Susan Palumbo. And this is a story about a young woman named Anna whose sister as children disappeared from a campground when she was 10, when the sister was 10. And Anna and her grief and her guilt has decided to basically take off on what she sees as her sister's personality and to live the life that she thinks her sister should have. And I think the reason why it didn't work for me is that is not how my mind works. I think this might also be an issue of culture since it seems from what Anna is saying as she's narrating is she feels like as the older sibling it's her responsibility or her family sees it as her responsibility to take care of her younger sibling. And that is not a culture I grew up in. I have a younger sister, but I was a mean big sister. I can admit that. <laughs> and it soon became very clear to my mom that I should not be in charge of my sister. And we could both be left at home, but we were both responsible for ourselves. So it, it's just, this isn't an experience that I have had. So this came out in the Dark Magazine. And it's because there is a darker element for why the sister went, disappeared and how it relates to the past, and specifically her mother's past. And she does eventually find out what that is. So coming in at number five for me is Proof by Induction by Jose Pablo Iriarte. And this is about a young, or this is about a man called Polly whose father has just died. And then Polly and his father are both mathematicians and Polly's trying to get tenure, his father had tenure. But they were also working on a mathematical problem together, trying to solve it. And this is a, really a story about relationships and how our relationships are what we choose unless we ask for something different. This is a near science fiction story where at this time, a person as they die, their last consciousness, their consciousness at the very end can be saved. Most people use that to ask, oh, hey, where is your will? Is there something I should be aware of? Those sort of things can get closure. But Polly decides to use this coda of his father and to continue working through the mathematical problem. In reality, he's working on his own grief of 
what he had wanted from his father and what he never had the conversation with them about. And we see in his own interactions with his own child how he's trying to be different. And he's not blaming his father for what he had, but he's recognizing that from the relationship, he didn't get what he needed. And so it's really, like, yes, there, he focuses on the problem, or on the mathematical problem, but the bigger story is everyone deals with grief differently. Especially when there is a relationship that feels unresolved. Coming in at number four, I have For Lack of a Bed by John Wiswell. This is an own voices story. The main character in the story has a chronic illness, and the author also has a chronic illness. When the main character is saying how tired and their body is, you know that the author knows exactly how to write that feeling. Naomi, she is wanting a bed, can't afford one. Her roommate ends up finding a sofa, and she accepts the sofa even though someone has died on it. It's not stained or anything, so she's like, whatever. And she ends up having the best sleep that she's had in years and really enjoying the sofa. And then she doesn't want to leave the sofa. Now, this is also a paranormal story because she works in a pet shop and she talks about having to deal with hellhounds and other supernatural creatures. And her sleeping in and missing shifts finally catches the attention of one of her co-workers, who is a succubus, who comes over to investigate, only to find out that the sofa is not a sofa, it is a succubus turned into a sofa. And the whole concept of succubus turning into inanimate objects so that they get their hunger fed, as well as making a trade with the people who are being fed upon. And then Naomi has to decide does she really want to destroy the sofa that has been helping her body not be in as much pain? And I'm going to let you find out how she handles things. So number three I have is Lit All the Children Boogie by Sam J. Miller. And this follows Lori, who is at the turning point in her life as she's trying to discover, or she's trying to be comfortable with the fact that she is queer. And she doesn't know how she exactly fits into that or what that looks like in her life or her family and she ends up meeting Fo, who is also queer and she immediately is willing to accept Fo for who they are and is fascinated by their confidence they are brought together through a radio program that they listen to late at night begin to share songs with one another Soon after, during this radio program, a uh, broadcast starts interrupting with strange messages, which makes Lori think that somebody's airwaves are crossing over and it's a terrorist plot. And she sees more ramping up of military, which makes her think that, yeah, that's what's going on. But Fell has a different take. Fell thinks that it is a time traveler. And they work together to figure out where the signal is coming from all the while figuring out who they are and how they can have the confidence and power to be who they are, no matter what else anybody else thinks. Number two I have is Mr. Death by Alex E. Harrow. And again, I'm really bad. I'm not remembering the main character's name. I think it's Sam, but he is a worker in the Department of Death and his job is to go collect souls. And it's not just be there at the moment of their death, it's also, you spend the last few hours with them watching up to the end so that when they die, you can collect them with compassion. In this world or this universe, when you die, you cross a, the guide helps you to cross a dark river and then you just dissolve into the universe. And it doesn't go into anything further of what might be there or what that means or anything else. That's not the point of the story. So Sam has been doing this for a while and he gets the 
newest charge to reap a little child, I think two or three years old. And that brings back the grief and memories of his when his own child died. And he's not sure he wants to do that. So he goes and he spends time with the child and the child can see him. And he sees how bright this child's soul is and how if this child could live, they would be a mover and a shaker. They would change things. And he doesn't want the child to die. So he saves their life. And then has to deal with the consequences of that. Especially since that is against, you know, the order of things and this child has a heart condition. So he's just given a new date. So this is another story that deals with grief and what can people do as they heal. And then my favorite story out of the six that were nominated is Where Oaken Hearts Do Gather by Sarah Pinsker. This is written in a very unique style, kind of mixed media as well. If you have gone to look up lyrics online, you'll know kind of what this setting is, but it's the story is basically a lyrics page where people can contribute and talk about the song, what they think the meaning of things are. And in this one, they choose the old folk tale where oaken hearts do gather, and they start sharing history with one another. So it is it is told in like you get to read the verses of the stories and then like the footnotes where people have made comments or oh hey this is the history of this or oh hey I think this means this and as they talk back and forth with one another there's even like a link to a version of this song sung now it was very echoey and it did not work for me so I did not finish it but I think the concept of doing that was very cool and when if you go to it it really plays a song on YouTube and it even says that it's connected to this story. And I liked the idea of as they're trying to de like determine the history of this folk song of is it true? Where did it originate from? What are the these clues mean? What what is this? And it was it was fun to walk through that process and see how things fell out or how things end up and Pinsker did a great job of layering in the details so when you finally get to the end of this lyric page you know what has been happening you know a lot more about this song than many of the posters or contributors for this conversation and yeah like I said it was just so much fun I really really enjoyed it. So have you read any of these short stories? Which one was your favorite? I'd love to hear. Please let me know down below. Thank you and have a good day.